thank you and welcome to everyone for and thank you for being here this evening. Um, it's really a pleasure to have both Julie and Michael here. They have uh, done a meticulous reporting job on the current administration's approach to immigration, the president's attitude. They've looked at uh, in, in significant ways the motivations behind some of the policies today. And, and indeed, they've also looked at many of the characters and have drawn them in full dimension within the book. And so I really want to begin by asking you, uh, this immigration issue is the signature issue, I think, for President Trump. It's how he got into office. How did he actually get to this point where immigration became really the focus of his politics and now of his policies? I mean, so it, 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 the thing that uh, is kind of difficult to reconcile now, three years in, when we've seen everything that's uh, happened during the, during the uh, presidency, it's hard to kind of reconcile the fact that it was sort of accidental, that <laughs> he has always, pe people who know him and have known him for a long time say he always harbored these kind of um, views about immigrants and the dangers of immigrants and the desire to keep immigrants out. Um, but he, and so that was really a, a visceral thing for him, but he wasn't, um, as, he, as he thought about running for president, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily obvious that that would be the thing that was going to uh, sort of be the cornerstone of his campaign. Uh, but he also is a person who is um, more than anything a kind of PR magician, and he, and he feeds off of the um, kind of energy that he gets from the crowds. And so as he started speaking around the country and talking about the possibility of running for president, uh, when he would talk about immigrants, when he would you know, express these sort of uh, really kind of uh, um, hardline uh, restrictionist views about wanting to keep immigrants out, and he would talk about them in the over-the-top way that we now recognize as his kind of way of talking. The crowd would love it, and would and the and the feedback that he got, the feedback loop that that created, um, really uh, kind of f um, you know sort of uh, uh, made him want to do that even more. The problem is that because he's such an undisciplined and, and kind of all over the map kind of speaker, he sometimes would forget and he sometimes would not, you know, sort of go there. And that's when some of his aides decided we need something, we need a device to make sure he gets back to the immigration message. Mm -hmm. A hook. A hook, a mnemonic device, something. And they, and, they, and they decided, you know, he's a builder. He always talks about wanting to build things. And why don't we tell him that he can... Build, he'll build a wall and Mexico will pay for it. Um, he, he, the first time he did the speech, he called it a fence instead of a wall, <laughs> uh, but eventually kind of got there and it worked. And he loved it, they loved it, and that became the kind of centerpiece of his campaign. And, but, you know, by some accounts, uh, the president personally has no animus towards foreigners per se, but it manifested itself during the campaign, certainly, and it, and it came out in phraseology, which really was quite offensive and really detrimental to many of those uh, immigrants and others who aren't, don't share, if not um, American citizenship, then certainly a, a, an ethnicity which identifies itself in very limited circles as being American. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, right, because he's a, he's a New Yorker. Yes. Uh, he... Uh, you know, lived in Manhattan for decades in probably the most diverse uh, city in the world. And, uh, you know, he was mixing with, he was a Democratic donor. I mean, he was mixing with, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of different people from every, all sorts of different countries. He was doing business around the world. There was really no indication that he harbored any ill will toward um, people who were not native born Americans. But I do think that uh, he saw the political power in this issue. Um, and also it was a way for him, I mean, Trump, did, when he was thinking about running and when his advisors were advising him about how he could sort of uh, market himself in a way that would be unique, uh, he really wanted to be uh, identified as someone outside of conventional politics, that he was not a politician. He was going to tell you the truth. He was going to um, say the things that nobody else was willing to say. And he was going to address these issues that have been around for a long time that uh, really indicated how broken Washington and the whole political system was. And 
what better example of that than immigration, right? The system is not functioning uh, the way it should in this country. It hadn't been overhauled for decades since the 1986 uh, amnesty under Ronald Reagan. And, uh, you know, they tried and failed time after time to try to uh, come to some terms to, to get their hands around this issue in Washington. And so coming in as a person who wanted to run against the machine, immigration was a really useful kind of proxy issue for him and a way for him to talk to the white working class, frankly, which I think he identified early on and his advisors identified early on as a real key to if he was going to have success as a candidate, they were going to be the uh, the fulcrum of that. And there were two issues that really mattered to them. I think he and his advisors both thought immigration and trade. And this was part of sort of the way that he wanted to identify himself to the American people. Right. So it was this package of trade and immigration that really he, on the one hand, was getting feedback on and saying, yeah, the more you talk about this, the greater your political uh, value in the, and likelihood of, uh, of winning, but also an expediency, it sounds like. And so Having spent as much time on this research and on these individuals who have shaped both this policy and the president himself, do you feel that he actually now has become that person, that two-dimensional character who he projects himself as? Does he now actually believe perhaps some of these things? And, and I'm asking you as insiders now rather than as those who are observing from a journalistic perspective, but rather just uh, on a gut level, is he now that person? Yeah, I think he is. I mean, I think he really has. Uh, and I, I think he actually started out from way back. I mean, I talked about how he was a Manhattanite and had was mixing with people from all over the world. But he was brought up in Queens in a pretty uh, segregated uh, portion of Queens uh, where uh, the white people and the wealthier people lived one place and the black people or the immigrant, the new, more newly arrived immigrants from other places lived elsewhere. And there was a big separation. And he always kind of had this like in, intrinsically bigoted way of looking at he, things. He, people described him as Archie Bunker. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, that was sort of the, the kind of description of his kind of bigotry, his kind of sort of xenophobia. It was um, sort of a gut level kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of desire to have those people elsewhere. And, you know, wh whether that meant elsewhere from him or elsewhere outside of the country, I think it manifested itself. And I do think, I agree with Julie, that I think he has, um, it's hard to separate now, um, especially after documenting in the book, the, the, the amount of times that he, both his actions and his words have led to um, real negative consequences for immigrants. It's hard to separate um, kind of the personal beliefs from the political expediency. And so, Julie, you mentioned earlier that there really hasn't been anything done since the Reagan uh, era in, on immigration, that it is a broken system, that I think everyone on both sides of the aisle recognizes this issue. We seem to almost come to some level of uh, dealing with it during the George W. Bush administration, and then 9-11 occurred, and that seemed to change the equation. So we fast forward to today, and we have, as you describe in the book, and as you've just told us, an, a situation where the president is very intransigent on these issues, and it's manifesting itself in very dramatic ways on the border, and the book is called Border Wars. So maybe you could talk about some of the ways that it's now expressing itself in very dramatic ways uh, on the border itself. Yeah, well, I mean, it was it's interesting because you, you talk about how he's been intransigent, which is true. Um, but there was a sort of a brief period after Trump won the presidency when I think uh, some of his people and certainly some Republicans and Democrats that we talked to from the book for the book uh, felt like he could be the president who could make the big deal on immigration that had eluded other presidents because he already had all of this credibility with immigration hawks, with the right, mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, with his base that he could almost do anything on immigration and they would buy into it because it would be Trump who's campaigned as a hardliner. And if he says it's OK, it's OK. And he's married to an immigrant. And he's married to an immigrant. <laughs> and he, uh, for the second and time. And he's a New Yorker. <laughs> and, you know, like that he could actually yes. be the one. And and we talked to, you know, it was, it was actually kind of interesting interesting in the first few months of doing the book and talking to people on both sides of the political aisle, 
it, they would use the same words. They would talk about Nick, this could be a Nixon to China thing mm -hmm. for Trump. Um, and it, it obviously became clear very quickly that he wasn't going to go there uh, and that he did not feel secure enough in his own political standing or really he did not he didn't feel sort of any compulsion to try to, to forge that compromise. And this is during a period when his legitimacy was being questioned on a regular basis, not uh, in terms of whether or not he was elected, but in terms of how he was elected because of the Russia mm -hmm. events and all these other... Right, uh, and I, I actually think that was a big part of it, is yeah. that he never felt secure enough in his mandate. He never felt that he had been embraced enough um, to really be able to sort of uh, negotiate from a position of strength and power. Right. And so he just, he never... He never did. Um, but so the, when you ask about the ways that, that that's manifested itself, you know, the the kind of uh, challenges that he's faced at the border are not unlike the challenges that President Obama faced. Sure. Uh, there was a huge migration from Central America that began in 2014, or really upticked in 2014, um, that the Obama administration had to contend with. And what we see is that because the president was so sort of bought into this identity as a hawk and the toughest, and I'm, I'm going to crack down, he, uh, he really missed a lot of opportunities to get his hands around that issue. He missed the opportunity to forge a legislative deal so that he could actually change some of the policies that might have been, allowed, enabled him to... Um, to uh, revise the way that that the that migrants are greeted at the border, but he also uh, implemented some practices that essentially fed instead of um, reduced the flow of people coming up. They people panicked because he talked about. Um, and implemented in some cases metering so that you right. couldn't get in at ports of entry so people would go around the ports of entry and now they're coming in illegally and now there are more people coming and they're panicked about if we don't come now we'll never get to come because you know there's going to be this big crackdown um, so he, the effect is there are more correct. immigrants who right. come I mean, as a result of one his one thing that you know I think people on both sides of the aisle and, and in academia who've studied this phenomenon all agree on is that the flow of migrants um, into the United States is very responsive to sort of public messaging. So if people think that there is a good chance that they're going to be able to enter and stay, they will try to come. And if people think that if that there's a, not a good chance that they're going to be able to enter and stay, they will not try to come because it's a dangerous and and horrific journey. And so there, you know, there's there's quite a bit of um, response to the actual realities on the ground, but also the messaging. So um, we saw that under the Obama administration when President Obama would say, you know, don't make this journey. If you remember that, he would say, don't bring your children, don't send your children, don't don't try to come because this will not work out well for you. Um, instead of doing that, President Trump has tried to really crack down in sort of brutal ways, and that also didn't help him achieve the, the ultimate end. So you have uh, a lot of talk about a wall that wasn't actually – practically speaking, hindering anybody, uh, and a lot of tough rhetoric and policies that instead of lessening the flow actually ended up feeding it. That's in incredible. And so that we now uh, get to a point where the wall becomes sort of this um, uh, physical uh, representation of a failed policy, a, a wall that by all accounts at its best would not be very effective in terms of, of stemming the flow. Uh, and so you have policies articulated that are intended to stem that flow and instead increase it. Uh, you have a physical barrier that is going to be built, you know, hell or high water as far as the president's concerned, where he's Doing, going to extraordinary measures to try and get this wall, despite Congress, despite uh, the will and the effectiveness of, uh, of a physical barrier, to, uh, to stop the flow. And so, by all accounts, everything he's tried to do has only backfired in terms of uh, all the policies and, and the, the brutality that, as you put it, uh, have really come to naught. Right. Well, and, and the thing that I think happens and that we try to document and uh, pretty extensively in the book is all of those failures add up to a mounting frustration for this president, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is the, the, the promise that he feels like he made in order to get elected was literally to build the wall, but more figuratively to build a wall so that you could keep people out. And instead of keeping people out, they're flooding in. 
right? The numbers every every day, the president is handed numbers. How many how many uh, illegal border crossings have there been that day, that week? Um, right. And, so and, during Vietnam, we were finding out how many American soldiers were being killed. Right. Abroad, very similar. But now it's and and his immigrants. mood. You could talk to the people in the White House who'd say his mood was was literally correlated with with those numbers and if those numbers were going up he was he was uh, would often you know go into a rage and if they were going down he would feel better and and what what we try to document is both the president's uh, reaction to that and the the bureaucratic response to his rage which was a kind of complicated mix of um, you know the bureaucracy, both the both the civil servants who had been there for a long time and the political appointees who President Trump put there, trying desperately to figure out how to accommodate this president, at least his goals, um, but increasingly to do so um, kind of uh, without without accepting his most outrageous suggestions. So they would they would frequently um, push back against building a moat and filling it with crocodiles right. and snakes, um, even as they would try to figure out, well, okay, if we can't, you know, we, you know, we got to get him off of the moat idea, but let's figure out what we can do to kind of reduce the flow. Can we make changes to the asylum system? Can we make changes to the uh, refugee program? And, and so, you know, the entire last two and a half, three years has been this kind of contest between this president who, who just you know, over and over and over again would seek the, to, to sort of reach for the most outrageous, over-the-top um, uh, approach that was as brutal as you could get to deter people. And because he had this, you know, desire to make good on his political promise for, the, for his base, uh, which he felt was necessary. Um, and you had a bureaucracy that was trying kind of on the one hand to accommodate him, but on the other hand, not accommodate him too much. Right. And so in that process, you went through some of the more outrageous physical issues, but also there were questions of separation. We have had right. caging of children that we've seen, certainly, and, and the images are, are just dramatic. Why is it that? And so I, I understand you're saying the, the more the frustration, the harsher the policies that he wants to pursue, and the more he's going to take it out on his team, whether it be his uh, Homeland Security Secretary or others, during that first two years when he essentially had the entire government on his side. You are a congressional reporter, Julie. Why was he unable to move his party to a solution that would be effective from a legislative perspective and supportive? Yeah, I mean, I think what we saw was that he was unable to move his own party on many issues. I mean, if you re remember the first year of his presidency, they tried and failed multiple times to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, right? This yes. is, you know, the healthcare, the biggest issue if you if you if you uh, believe the polls at the time uh, that voters cared about. And he could not, uh, he refused to sort of put out a position and stick to it in a way that Republicans could be confident that they could rally around it and, uh, you know, get to a, a yes that would be political, politically palatable for them. Um, on, on immigration, it was actually even worse because what he continued to do was to say, I mean, this, again, he is not a political animal. He is not of Washington. He was not used to the process that presidents go through where, you know, if you want to push a piece of legislation, if you want to get a big priority through Congress, you have to be very clear about what you're asking for. You have to use the bully pulpit to lobby for it. You have to put your reputation on the line and say, look at me, I'm willing to put my reputation on the line to do this. Here is exactly, Republicans, what I'm asking you to do. Come with me. I will cover you. Uh, he was never willing to do that. Right. He would put, he would say things and then Republicans would sort of be like, oh, is that going to be the position? And then he would immediately go the other way. In the beginning of his term, he talked a lot about wanting to help the dreamers, yes. um, young undocumented immigrants who were brought here as children uh, by their parents and raised in the United States. Right. He seemed to be sympathetic. He seemed to be sympathetic. He said, I want to help these kids. And and many Republicans, uh, including the Speaker of the House, were, were privately encouraging him, yeah, do something on DACA. We will be with you. Just, right. you know, if you will publicly say you're willing to do this, 
you will have the votes to do it. But he could never see his way clear to actually stick with a position like that because there was such a sense on his part and on the part of Stephen Miller and Steve Bannon and his uh, his more conservative advisors that that would be fatal. So he would like tiptoe up to the brink and then he would pull the rug out. And Republicans saw this happen enough times that they essentially were unwilling to uh, to believe it until they actually saw the tweet or, you know, the piece of legislation he was going to send them, which never happened, um, to, to actually go public and say, all right, I'm willing to support this. I'm willing to be at the negotiating table with Democrats on this uh, because they and, were not confident and they and it, they were they were right to not be confident right. that he was going to stick. And, and on position. the other side of the aisle. Right. So that's the dynamic Mm -hmm. on the Republican side that he could never lead his party to where many of them wanted to go. And on the Democratic side, the rhetoric, um, you know, the S-hole countries, the uh, scene that Julie and I documented first of of him sitting in the Oval Office saying all Haitians have AIDS and the Nigerians wouldn't want to go back to their huts in Africa. That all drove, you know, an even deeper wedge between President Trump and the Democrats, who were going to have to be part of any compromise. Immigration reform only happens in this country if it's a a bipartisan compromise. It's just not going to happen on the other way. And the Democrats ran the other direction and have, you know, at least in Washington, um, you know, have have become much more polarized on this issue because of President Trump. And so you had the Republican dynamic that Julie described and the Democratic dynamic. And as a result, it's just been stalemate since since then. And as those Democrats are running, as you put it, um, it seems that he has had some effectiveness in painting the Democratic Party as the party that is for open borders, despite the fact that they are advocating for, for at times, what they refer to as comprehensive immigration policy, but at other times, just real straightforward uh, policies, whether it be DACA or Mm -hmm. Dreamer Acts and things of that sort. How has he been so effective at at least painting them from a political perspective now uh, as and across the board? Certainly when you look at the candidates, every time someone speaks, it seems as if they are reinforcing his narrative that Democrats are for open borders. I'm for a wall and tough uh, immigration policy. This is, I think, one of Trump's superpowers and (laughs) Stephen Miller's superpowers is like he has essentially he uh, is such an effective troll and such an effective provocateur. Uh, that he often, he, he gets such a rise out of Democrats, out of the left, out of progressives, by talking the way he talks, by proposing the things he proposes, by implementing the policies he does, um, to where we're at a point now where you have many Democrats saying we should just defund ICE altogether, no immigration enforcement. Uh, some of the presidential, many of the presidential candidates have said, you know, we, we should decriminalize crossing the border without authorization. Uh, they're talking about, you know, giving uh, health benefits and other benefits to undocumented people. Um, this is not a place where the Democratic Democratic Party had ever been or had been at the critical mass of the Democratic Party had been before President Trump came on the scene. But but he has sparked this reaction on uh, among Democrats by going so far to the right himself. They have essentially pulled themselves further to the left, uh, almost to compensate for it. And and I think there is a recognition among Democrats, even though in the 2018 congressional elections, I think this issue really hurt a lot of Republicans. It's one of the reasons that Republicans lost the House because the president was out there at rallies talking about it's an invasion, there's a caravan, they're coming to hurt you, they're coming into your communities. And a lot of voters in the suburbs, independents and Republicans were very turned off by that and were like, I just care about the economy and health care. Like, I don't want to hear about, you know, I don't I don't actually buy into this idea that immigrants are criminals who are going to, you know, threaten my life. Um, But I do think that Democrats have been unwilling to, and in many cases feel like they don't have to because the president's talking the way he talks, uh, make their own case for what they think the immigration policy should be. Because it's it's they spend so much time and energy talking about why President Trump's uh, formulation is wrong and why it's indefensible that they don't actually go the the other step and say, here's what we would do instead. And I think they feel like it would be dangerous for them to do that because it is a very divisive issue, even among Democrats. Right. And so you look to California and you see some manifestation of maybe an affirmative policy. But of course, California doesn't run uh, a border policy. It doesn't have the power as a subnational actor to be able to define uh, what immigration should look like the same way that they can't 
define a foreign policy. They can be active in certain level of trade. They can do any number of other things. But you have this uh, this leader in the state, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, the state has about 27% of its population is foreign born, unlike the rest of the country, which is about 14% foreign born and he is doing some of these things that you talk about he is talking about um health care for instance for immigrants his first trip overseas was to el salvador to northern triangle to as he put it understand the root causes of the types of immigration that are occurring are we seeing this also in other parts of the border uh in the united states in texas new mexico arizona uh, to some extent, I mean, there's, you know, there are local, there are certainly differences between local communities like El Paso and, uh, you know, communities along the border that are having to take matters into their own hands in some ways, deal with the influx of migrants because, uh, uh, because of the failure of the federal government to deal with it. That has been true long before Trump. I mean, there have been complaints in places uh, along the border that the federal government wasn't living up to its obligations on immigration since, since before Trump came along. But I think to the extent that the president's policies, as Julie described it earlier, have have actually um, uh, exacerbated the problem at the border rather than, than actually fix it, um, you know, local communities have had to step in. I think, you know, we dealt mostly in our book with the federal policies. That's our expertise. We're in Washington. We talked a lot about that. Um, but one of the subjects that we that we mentioned a, a little bit is is the the whole sanctuary city debate. This was something that President Trump and uh, especially Session, uh, Attorney General Sessions um, was particularly interested in. They they you know um, were, were did whatever they could early on uh, to try to combat defund cities that were that considered themselves sanctuary cities. Um, that didn't really go very far. They got stopped a little bit in the courts, and they have and and the and cities really did both cities and and uh, uh, individual police departments and sheriff's departments really pushed back on some of the things that they tried to do. Um, but that, there's an example of the tension between uh, kind of the federal policies and the efforts that the Trump administration went after as, and, the, and the local communities. Right. And we have talked about the legislative challenges and the confrontations between the president and Congress. You've now talked a little bit about the subnationals, the states and their and locales uh, versus the federal government. But you also brought up just now the question of the courts. And the courts have not exactly been uh, supportive of the president's policies as well. It started essentially day one mm -hmm. when he, what we'll refer to in simple terms is the Muslim ban. Right. Could you talk a little bit about how that and, and maybe how that has then followed into what his current uh, approach is? I mean, well, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it, it, it really, um, the, the, um, the Muslim ban, the travel ban that he imposed five days after the, uh, after the administration began, um, you know, really did spark a kind of new judicial activism, not necessarily on the part of the judges themselves, though the Republicans would contend that that is the case, um, but certainly a new kind of uh, intense activism on the part of uh, the ACLU and the immigrant rights organizations, which decided, I think, very early on in, in kind of the wake of that travel ban that that uh, they could see what was coming. And what was coming was they could see that the legislative process wasn't going to work. The president was uh, determined, bound and determined to sort of imp use the power of executive orders, executive actions uh, to make uh, progress on this. We write about a, a group in, in the early days of the, tr the Trump administration that we, we dubbed the sort of Hamilton group, which was a group of people um, who had worked throughout the transition period, uh, people that, that Trump and uh, Stephen Miller had recruited from Capitol Hill who had been sort of on the fringe of immigration policy. And they worked on over 100 executive orders in this space to try to you know, uh, what uh, Steve Bannon called a sh kind of a shock and awe sort of approach where you just sort of put it all out there. And so the legal and, 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 and Stephen then continued, Stephen Miller continued uh, to run a kind of think tank inside the White House where he'd have a big whiteboard and write, out, write down every possible idea they could think of in terms of, you know, turning off all the spigots of legal and illegal immigration. And so, you know, that realization sparked an incredible amount of um, judicial activism on the part of these groups, which challenged everything because they thought that's the only way they're going to kind of put a wrench in it. And 
the president hasn't had no successes. He has had some success getting a little bit of the money uh, that he wanted from his national emergency. He got the travel ban after the third attempt. Uh, but a lot of the, of the sort of broader agenda has been stopped in the courts. Right. And that money was money that he was allowed to then take from other parts of the federal government, mainly from DOD, from the Defense Department, right? And then apply towards... Right. And ultimately from communities, right? Those were, that was money that the, the Defense Department was going to spend in communities all over the country to build projects and programs that, you know, are now diverted to the law. And part of this was, I mean, we did see a lot of pushback, we have seen a lot of pushback from the courts on the the travel ban, on uh, the ending of DACA, on some of the changes they, that Trump tried to make on asylum, on some of the regulations that he's implemented. But part of that was by design, right? I mean, this was partly a strategy by Stephen Miller to say, you know, if you look at the laws and the Constitution, the president's powers to control immigration are pretty vast. They're pretty, he has pretty wide latitude to invoke national security or the well-being of the country and and take action just unilaterally without Congress to really push the limits of presidential power and have a real impact on immigration. And so part of the goal, I think, of a lot of these things was to say, Okay, so sue us and let's just see. Let's have the court rule. And and by the way, the Supreme Court now has a conservative majority. So let's just see how much of this we can get away with and potentially set precedents that will be longstanding that will confirm that the president has the power to do these things. Right. And he would have. And, and I think Julie's exactly right. The frustration that especially Stephen Miller and Jeff Sessions and Steve Bannon felt looking back at decades of Democrats and Republicans who they thought had kind of given up on all of these powers, right, had never really, had never really seized the powers that, that, that they thought the president should have. And I think, you know, the, the attempt to reinvigorate those powers was really central to what they were trying to accomplish. And that's likely what we're going to continue to see during the remainder of this presidency, whether it's two years or four years, is pushing on these boundaries, especially as what we've seen over time is Congress giving up some of that authority that they've had, whether it be in the authorization of the use of military force or in other areas where the tough questions are one that ones that they sometimes punt on. And secondarily, uh, the executive, not strictly that presidency of Donald Trump, but the presidency over time has agglomerated as much power and asserted more power uh, annually. Uh, and as you're now saying, really bringing it to a head. And so maybe this moment uh, when we're talking about impeachment and we're looking at judicial challenges is one where we'll be able to see what the limits actually are of what some would call an imperial presidency, but others would just call an executive privilege <laughs> to be able to exercise this type of authority. Right. I mean, to be fair, uh, Barack Obama was pretty expansive in the use of his uh, executive authority on this issue. I mean, DACA was a, you know, even he said that uh, he wasn't a king and you can't just wave a magic wand and legalize a group of people, but he figured out a way. And I think in part, I mean, I, I, I believe that, uh, that o Obama and the administration wanted DACA to come into effect and they didn't do it just to provoke a legal challenge. But I think that was part of the part of the thinking was, you know, let's see if we can if we can get this uh, legitimized because um, because the president does have some powers here that haven't that that former presidents haven't availed themselves of. And now we're about to see next week when when the DACA case comes to oral argument in the Supreme Court, whether uh, whether the Supreme what the Supreme Court is going to say about that. Now, part of the case that uh, that they have against the, the Trump administration's ending of the program is that they did it in such a haphazard way without any real policy process, which is such a theme of our book as well. So many of the things that he set out to do, they just kind of try to so short circuit all of the normal channels of policymaking where the career people inside the government who are experts go through these things and uh, check all the boxes and write all the memos and sign all the paperwork. Um, and so that's part of the reason this is being challenged. But it's also going to be a question of how wide the president's latitude is on these issues. And, and when we interviewed Trump, uh, he talked about this, that, you know, if this ruling goes, if it goes against him, he essentially says, well, that means I can just do anything because that means Obama had the power to create this program and then I could just do anything. So, you know, 
Katie bar the door. And of, of course, if it goes for him, then he feels like he's justified in having ended the program. Right. Uh, you know, I, before I go to the audience questions, I do want to just try, try to ask about a global contextualization of what it is that's going on in the United States and some of the political um, directions that, uh, that are being supported within the U.S. Because what we see is uh, this question of migration and the political fortunes of those who are anti-immigrant rising around the world and mainly uh, in areas that are allied with the United States. We see it in Germany with the rise of the Alternative for Deutschland. We see it in Hungary, of course, where there is actual physical borders being defended and where immigrants are being arrested and, and uh, in, put into conditions not dissimilar to those uh, along our southern border. Sweden has one of the largest anti-immigrant parties in power. It, are, it, are, what we're, are what we're witnessing here in the United States, is, is, have you been able to put it into a larger trend that is going on worldwide? And, and one more question. This is happening at a time of global economic expansion, which right. seems to have some level of dissonance in terms of what political scientists believe to be the case when you look at anti-immigrant fervor. But it's also happening. So I, so the economic situation in the world is, is maybe not as dire as you would think to be sparking this kind of thing, but it's also happening at a time of um, maximum refugee uh, displacement around the world, right? I mean, we're already, you know, we may be seeing another two and a half million, you know, refugees displaced out of Turkey into Syria, given recent events, but Venezuela, elsewhere around the world, there are, if you talk to advocates uh, for refugees, they will tell you this is a moment of, you know, in, an in, uh, you know, incredible number of refugees uh, that are that are displaced from their homes around the world, and I think, you know, throughout Europe, obviously, it's affected affected Angela Merkel and her fortunes, her political fortunes, the extent to which she was willing to take Syrian refugees during the height of the. Uh, the fighting there over the kind of tail end of Obama's term. Um, we, saw, we saw immigration and, and the kind of impact of immigration playing out in the Brexit fight in the United Kingdom. Um, I, you know, you even saw a little bit of cross-pollination with Steve Bannon, you know, heading over to Europe and yes. trying to stoke the same kind of political anarchy, you know, populism that he that he participated in here and doing it over there to less with somewhat less success. Um, and, and I think, you know, while our book doesn't deal with a lot of the kind of global trends, one thing we do spend a fair amount of time on is the kind of connection between the United States um, and and its its willingness throughout history and, and in, at the current moment to take some of those refugees to be a place of refuge for uh, those communities. Obviously, some of that's along the southern border through the asylum system, uh, but we spend a, a really a fair amount of time talking about the refugee program in the United States, which at the, at the, at the end of the Obama administration, um, with the surge in, in, in refugees around the world, the Obama administration had raised the cap, the limit of the number of refugees that can come into the country every year to 110,000. It was the highest it had been in a number of years. Um, ever. Ever. Well, I think, his, I think yeah, maybe, way. yeah, exactly. Um, and, 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 you know, kind of led by Stephen Miller and the president, obviously supportive, um, they have systematically attacked the program. I mean, it, they, they lowered, the, the travel ban lowered the cap to 50,000. The next year they lowered it to 45. The next year they lowered it to 30. And this year the cap is now 18,000, which, at, at, at which is at a level that if you talk to the advocacy community, the refugee community, they will say that almost essentially starves the program completely. You have the kind of whole infrastructure that needs to exist to be able to process refugees and vet refugees and make sure they can come here, that sort of evaporates because there just aren't enough people coming through the system. And so, uh, and that was, and what we describe in the book is that that was not sort of some accidental thing. This was a methodical effort um, by uh, especially Stephen Miller to um, do everything that he could to redefine um, re refugees as a sort of a bad thing, whereas it had always sort of, sort of been looked at as a positive. And so you had um, a, a report that we talk about that uh, the Department of Homeland Security produced, which was uh, which concluded that on you know, sort of net, the uh, ref refugees were a net benefit to the United States kind of economically. Um, and when Stephen Miller was presented the draft of that report, he made sure it never came out because from his perspective, um, you know, that was... Uh, you know, that was the, the, the opposite of the message that he was trying to tell. And he would try to get kind of 
you know, insert into the public record uh, facts and figures, facts and figures that, you know, that um, were from, you know, sources that would that would document how bad refugees are so that, so that once it was in the public record, uh, he, it would help him the next time around mm -hmm. to kind of reduce the refugee program. And so I think there is a, a way in which what happens here is connected to the whole question of, of migration around the globe, and that's one of the ways that it's connected. Right. Uh, let me go to the questions here. And um, uh, one of the audience members asks, uh, Trump's view on immigration goes beyond the border. And uh, he asks, how are his policies affecting legal immigrants, those who have been here for a long time, uh, some of whom uh, uh, are now feeling threatened? Well, I mean, one way in in which the policies have affected legal immigrants is what Mike was just talking about in terms of the refugee program. Those are all legal immigrants, right. and they are now not able to come in in uh, numbers anywhere near as large as they were. Um, but there was also an effort to, you know, there, there are there are many communities throughout the United States who have that have existed uh, for a long time of people who essentially uh, don't have status. Uh, Indonesian Christians, uh, people from Cambodia, people from various areas of the world uh, where they, they feel that they can't return to or they they cannot return to without facing persecution that essentially for, for a long time have had sort of an unwritten deal with the American government where they check in with immigration authorities every six months or every year and, you know, keep their noses clean and are law-abiding citizens and they have families here and they're thriving members of their communities and they don't get bothered. And uh, the Trump administration has targeted some of those communities for deportation. Um, and th those, some of those, uh, those initiatives got challenged in court and in some cases were blocked. Um, but as, as Mike said, they have been, they see this as a numbers game. So they have been looking for ways to, Get as many, get rid of as many people who are not strictly authorized immigrants as they can, um, and then in terms of the legal immigration system, it's been harder to get visas. It takes a longer time to become naturalized. Um, fees and waiting times for these things have gone up, and. In the at the end of the day, even though the president uh, often talks about asylum seekers as just sort of run of the mill criminal border crossers, um, that is a legal immigration system. I mean, uh, claiming asylum at the border is a legal process, and it has become much more difficult to do, if not impossible, for many people. So uh, as much as uh, the president and his, his supporters like to talk about, well, this is just about illegal immigration, uh, there has been a profound effect on legal immigration, and it's been by design. Right. I myself come from a refugee family. Um, but uh, I think the second part of this question also alluded, I think, to um, minority uh, people who are within the United States, not just migrants, but actually those who belong to minority communities. And if that is affecting them in any way, I know that the question of the census today is in part, uh, the question is whether or not that is intended to target uh, migrant communities rather than migrants or those whose status could or could not be legal at this point. I mean, one of one of the things that has you know sort of uh, that the president has tried to do and backed off at times and whatever is to increase what they what um, what the kind of uh, government calls interior enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not cracking down along the border against people who are coming in, but but going out into the communities and cracking down on people who um, have lived and are living in communities in sort of the interior of the country and. Um, you know, part of that is, to, to Julie's point about the numbers game, there's some kind of low-hanging fruit. If you, There's a lot of people in the country who, have, um, who are undocumented, who have exhausted their appeals, who have been ordered by a court that they must leave, and then they, they, they don't. And so from, a, from an enforcement perspective, if you can find some of those people, more of those people, and kick them out of the country, you're going to reduce the numbers of immigrants who are in the country. The, the, the problem that previous administrations have always grappled with um, in doing interior enforcement is sort of twofold. One is a lot of those people, even though they are technically undocumented, are you know, living and, and deeply embedded into the communities in this country. And second, the, the, the level of enforcement tends to 
affect people who are not undocumented, who are here legally, but who are members of those same communities and who, you know, are both connected to the undocumented because they might be married to them or might be, you know, might be um, sort of connected to them through other ways. Um, but also just that the, you know, the idea of the enforcement, the raids coming through your communities creates a, a sense of fear and a sense of, um, you know, uh, uh, panic in those communities. And I think, you know, Previous administrations have struggled with that. This administration, um, I, certainly President Trump and, and Stephen Miller and some of the other people around him have wanted to do more of that. One of the things they've come up against is some of the bureaucrats who recognize the, the, the problems with, with a, a high level of, in, of interior enforcement, and there's been a lot of struggle inside the administration. Uh, another questioner uh, wants to ask uh, about the working relationship between Kirsten Nielsen <laughs> And uh, uh, what some of the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not having a, uh, in, 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 in essence, the question is, what ultimately pushed her out, uh, is how the questioner puts it. Uh, so Our last chapter, read the last Kirsten chapter. Kirsten Nielsen's. Oh, okay. <laughs> By the book. Yeah. Uh, Nielsen's relationship with uh, President Trump was very fraught. Um, you know, she was... Uh, she was a person who would speak back to him, which, you know, uh, when you talk to, when, when we interview sources about what it's like to work for Trump, uh, there's a lot of yelling, you know, there's a lot of lecturing, there's a lot of F-bombs in meetings. Um, there's a lot of um, pretty abusive kind of lecturing that he, that you can be subject to. And some people just sit there and take it. But Kirsten Nielsen never did that. She would, she would speak back to him and argue with him and say, no, Mr. President, this is why. And like, no, you can't do that. And well, that's not going to work. And she, you know, she sort of was a person who had come up during the Bush administration and had pretty conventional views of what it meant to let work in an administration and try to execute on the president's policy. And I think for a long time tried to, uh, figure out a way to give Trump as much of what he was asking for as she could without violating uh, legal boundaries, without violating her own moral or the country's values, uh, without uh, veering into a territory that would be completely impractical, which many of his proposals ultimately were. Um, and I think for a, a time felt like she could she could do that if she could just kind of keep a lid on this and figure out a way. OK, so he's an immigration hawk. How can we get better control of the border? How can we have uh, less people coming in? How can we have a more orderly system? Um, but very quickly, it became clear to her, I think, that he was never going to be satisfied. Every time he would see her, he would say, Kirsten. What about the wall? And he would, he would, you know, he would want to ha engage her in, you know, a thirty-minute conversation about. What the wall? I want like? flat black paint. <laughs> I want flat black. You understand flat black, because it's beautiful and it will attract the heat, and then people will get burned, and that will be exactly what I want. And you know, she's basically having to take this all in. And at one point, uh, one scene we 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 document in the book is. At the end of 2018, just before the government shutdown, uh, she knows that he's very dissatisfied with with what he's gotten in terms of the wall, and he keeps on going on about all the you know the detailed design that he does not, doesn't like what you're building. I want something else. So she basically decides, okay, I'm going to just take notes on everything he says, and I'm going to get someone at the Department of Homeland Security to do a mock up. And mm -hmm. I'm and next time he goes off on a tangent, and I can't get him talk down from his rage, I'm just going to show it to him mm. and he's going to be happy. And and indeed she does That's it. Like, she goes and she gets the mock up. She's in a meeting with him before the shutdown happens and he's you know, spinning himself up into a raid. Where's the wall? Why are there so many people coming? And, the, and she says, oh, I just remembered, Mr. President, I have this. And she gives him this folder and there's the picture of the wall with like spiky little flagpole type things, exactly how he had described it to her. And he is thrilled and completely forgets what he was talking about <laughs> and yells for Dan Scavino, who's his social media director, so that he can tweet this image, which of course was a completely fake thing that was never meant to exist and was never built, but it was just meant to pacify him. So this is kind of, this is this is their relationship. Uh, just just to cut to the chase, what, what gets her fired finally is just saying no to him one too many times. He decides he wants to completely shut down the border and she is trying to describe to him why that's completely impossible. You can't just shut down the border with Mexico. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, essentially, right to the last minute, thought that she could uh, 
save herself by bringing him a six-point plan for how she was going to get control of the border. And she goes to him in the White House resident, and she's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. It's the six C's. And he's basically like, no, 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 it's not, <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> You're fired. You're fired. Right. And as you ultimately put it, the numbers kept going up. And right. so that also didn't help her case in any way because she was unable to stem the flow. Uh, another question, uh, a questioner here, it really talks very specifically, maybe it's about this particular wall or fence or border, um, wall, border barrier. Recently, it was reported that Mexican border runners had used a $100 chainsaw with high quality cutting belts to quickly cut out a hole in President Trump's newly designed fence. Wondering how this cost compares to the work, cost to plug this hole, and many and the many more to follow. Yeah. Uh, Somebody, by the way, uh, printed this question before yeah. they came here, so who was this, they were ready to go. Was, I, I will say this was a great story, and it was not us; it was the Washington Post this time. Uh, they they had that; it was a great story. Um, it is, um, you know, look part of part of what the the fight over the wall inside the administration has always been is is between the president with his kind of personal vision versus the reality of what the, um, you know, the people actually that do this, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Border Patrol people who are actually there understood was would work or wouldn't work. If there was a long period of time where all he wanted was a concrete wall because he thought, you know, concrete is this big sort of edifice that he, I think, you know, would, um, you know, sort of satisfy something in him. And his people would come to him and say that the sort of experts that Nielsen and her team would come and say, well, you know, Mr. President, the, you know, there's lots of problems with that. You can't see across the Border Patrol people want to see. And, you know, actually, if you, you know, if you're on the other side, if you're the, the people coming in, you, you go to Home Depot, you get this expandable grout stuff, you sort of poke a hole in the cement and you squirt the grout in and within, you know, a short period of time, the whole thing is cracked and they just push it through. And so, you know, and it took forever to get him off of the idea of a, a cement fence and he eventually did. Um, and the, this idea of the kind of steel bollards, we, we describe in one of the, the sort of prologue of our book, um, that when he's describing it to Kirsten Nielsen, he says, I just, it has to be, it has to be like, like flagpoles, one flagpole after another flagpole after another flagpole. And then he turns to her and says, I got a great flagpole guy. I'll put you in touch with him. <laughs> and, um, so had a supplier. You know, like, but, but, but that's, that's his sort of, but, you yeah. know, he's not an expert on right. walls, right? And, and I think that the, the, <laughs> the idea that, um, I mean, it, the, the truth is probably, there's not, I mean, the whole fence isn't, I mean, the whole wall isn't coming down with a, you know, you sort of picture a guy with a chainsaw, but it's, it's an example of the kind of consequence that comes from yeah. having the process backwards, right? Instead of the experts coming to him saying, this is the kind of wall we should build, as Julie said, he's coming and literally describing exactly what he wants and forcing the bureaucracy to adapt to that. Right. And so one of the, uh, I have a couple questions here that are quite similar. And as, as you, Julie, has said, you know, it's really been a while since we've come up with some kind of uh, solution or it, whether, or at least temporary fix to what is an ongoing problem that we all as a nation recognize and other nations recognize is, is a challenge to, and, and President Trump would say uh, back when he was a candidate and also as president, if you don't have borders, you don't have a country. Uh, the idea that you have to defend these borders to define uh, a nation state is really something that's imprinted in him and not just him, but in those with other countries. So, um, but now we're many years after the Reagan presidency and his Amnesty, and uh, the questioner asks, have Americans become apathetic about this issue? Um, what is the best way to avoid, uh, and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me, uh, is there a, a likelihood that we will now achieve a pro-immigration policy or even a more humane immigration policy? And, and another questioner, again, along this line says, will immigration be his Achilles heel? So has the tide turned? Are you sensing that in your reporting and, and as you went through the research for your book? No, I don't, I don't think we sense that the tide has turned. I mean, I, I do think it is the case that in the 2018 congressional elections, we saw the limits of this kind of a message that, you know, some Republicans and certainly independents and many Democrats uh, sort of reacted there was a backlash to this kind of rhetoric, to these kinds of policies, and that contributed to the fact that 
a lot of Republicans were swept from power in congressional districts, in sort of marginal congressional districts around the country. But I think by and large, this this issue is working for President Trump. And one of the things that uh, we feel that he has done, uh, unwittingly or unwittingly, is really pulled the two uh, parties apart on this issue so that it is going to be much harder to achieve any kind of consensus on this in the political arena. I, I do think it's it's sort of an unusual issue in that if you look at polls and if you just talk to people in general um, outside of the Trump rallies that we both cover where they're all, whether they're in Iowa or in Pennsylvania or in Texas, very close to the border, the immigration and the wall is like the first thing they bring up when you ask them why they like the president. But if you talk to people outside of that and you look at national polls, I think the critical mass of American opinion is very much in favor of some sort of reasonable bipartisan solution that involves, you know, a path to citizenship for at least some amount of undocumented immigrants who are currently here, a more orderly system, uh, things that the president actually has talked about and that uh, back in the Bush administration were debated and embraced by many Democrats in terms of a more merit-based system, a more a system that's more sort of uh, tilted than our current one is toward skills and education and in- incorporates more of that into uh, the criteria for uh, legal immigration than what we have now, which is mo- largely family-based. Um, I think there is some consensus around that in general, but the political process is so divorced from that that I'm not sure that we're going to see anything resembling it anytime soon. Um, I have uh, another question here, and uh, this is from someone named Steve, who uh, asks, in the I, in the Weiwei movie, Human Flow, there's a scene where Syrian immigrants come to a fence at the Macedonian border with dogs and armed guards. Have Europeans done what Trump did without the rhetoric and venom? And uh, I, I, by the way, have not seen the movie. I don't know it. Um, okay. Uh, but uh, uh, secondarily, there's a there's another aspect that uh, uh, that the Europeans have uh, another approach that they've taken, uh, which President Trump has also uh, executed on, and that is the uh, working with a border nation, in the case of Europe, with Turkey, to stem the flow of migrants to the European community, and of course, ever since the election of uh, uh, AMLO of Lopez Obrador. Uh, President Trump has had discussions with border country Mexico to uh, do some of the same things that Turkey has been doing, or at least allegedly been doing, or at least somewhat cooperating with the European community on. Right. So we, those two issues. Right. So I haven't seen I haven't seen the movie, so I don't I, I don't know. But I but I will say on the second point, um, we document a, a, a fair bit the effort that uh, the Trump administration efforts that the Trump administration made to uh, figure out ways to have uh, policies that would shift the burden of dealing with what is the United States, what they would consider the problem of immigration, but shift that to other countries. Um, you know, the, the, the one that they have sort of implemented the most at this point is what they call a Remain in Mexico plan, what they call the Migrant Protection Protocols, but it's essentially... Uh, the idea that when somebody comes and seeks asylum here, instead of waiting in the United States while their asylum case is, is, is uh, adjudicated, they're forced to wait in Mexico. Um, there are other proposals that they are, that, deals that they've worked on with some of the Central American companies. Um, it's a very wonky term. They call it a safe third country, which some European countries have, have also tried to stem migration, which is the idea that if uh, somebody comes from... Um, uh, say El Salvador crosses through Mexico and comes towards the United States, that, that the United States can turn them away and say, well, the first country you came through was Mexico, so you have to apply for asylum there, not here. Um, those, some of those agreements have been negotiated. They have not largely been implemented yet, so, that, so, so they, haven't been, um, they haven't come to fruition. They haven't had any real impact. Um, but, but they all sort of come, st- come from the, the basic belief that I think uh, I, was on a, I was on a trip to Europe with Stephen Miller early in the administration. He came back on the plane to talk to reporters after negotiating one of these kind of communiques with other nations in one of these big sort of group of seven meetings. Um, and what he was most proud of was inserting language into, the, um, into this kind of common 
statement that the countries had all signed on to, that countries should take care of their people themselves and not have, you know, that, that people, refugees should be dealt with in the countries closest to their home country, not in other countries. Um, and, and so it stems from this whole idea that we're going to push the problem a, a, away from our borders. And, um, you know, but that comes with controversy too. The, the, the people who are being turned away from the United States border and waiting in Mexico are doing so largely in squalid conditions um, with uh, uh, very little opportunity for any real sort of life and uh, a lot of danger because a lot of the Central American migrants are being, um, uh, are being preyed upon uh, by gangs and other things in Mexico where they're waiting. And so um, a lot of the, a lot of those um, attempts are being tied up in the court as well, uh, but but there's certainly there's certainly efforts that this administration has made. And and just briefly, um, the the administration before AMLO uh, came in, the Trump administration and President Trump himself spent a lot of time not talking with Mexico about how can we work together to sort of get our hands around this problem but trying to convince Peña Nieto to make a public statement that he would, in fact, pay for the wall. Yes. <laughs> right? I mean, that was, I mean, there was a whole visit planned where he was going to come to Camp David, and they had a phone call where they were supposed to bless this meeting, and it was, like, on the brink of happening, and the phone call devolved into just complete chaos because Trump kept saying, well, you're going to say the thing, right? And Peña Nieto was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to say that, <laughs> right? Um, and, then, and then the other thing I would just note is that, you know, uh, a, a lot of those, the, the work that you're talking about that happened with bordering countries has to do with money. And um, instead of thinking of ways to leverage American uh, aid, which has always flowed to Central America and to some degree Mexico, uh, to sort of uh, enhance uh, the United States' ability to deal with this issue, uh, what the tr president has done is instead withdrawn that aid, which in many cases has exacerbated the problem instead of solved it. Well, uh, Nancy Pelosi always ends her uh, talks these days talking about Ronald Reagan's last speech, which she, she encourages everyone speech. to <laughs> listen to. Could you explain why it's such an important speech? Uh, I think it's she she thinks it's an important speech because it is a Republican talking about how if the United States were to ever sort of close its doors to immigrants, that you, you sort of lose something fundamental about who we are as a country. And she likes to throw it in Trump's face frankly. And she said it when she uh, was elected again as Speaker of the House in January, and she says it at every opportunity. And I think it is a, a little bit of a subtweet of the current president. <laughs> and with that, I'd like you all to thank uh, Michael and, uh, and Julie for this wonderful presentation. <laughs>